Hey everybody, Dr. Aulis here. In this short video, we're going to talk about the macromolecule known as lipids. In general, when you think about lipids, you should be thinking about the primary way that we have energy storage for the long term. In your body, we have cells that are literally full of lipids, and their job is to store extra energy for when we need it later. But lipids also do several other functions in the body, including insulating and preventing heat loss, helping us to build hormones, helping us to build our plasma membrane, and also functioning in waterproofing. So all of these different functions done by different types of lipids, and there are many types of lipids that we see. So the general term that you'll think of when you hear lipids are our fats. So our fats come in various forms. We'll talk about the fatty acids that build these lipids. Uh, other things that would be considered lipids are things like oils or waxes, phospholipids, and finally steroids. Regardless of which specific kind of lipid we're talking about, all lipids are considered nonpolar and hydrophobic. When we talk about things that are nonpolar, we are meaning that they're built with nonpolar covalent bonds. A nonpolar covalent bond is a bond where electrons are equally shared between two different atoms. Remember that if I equally share my electrons, I have a really strong bond, but I also don't have any dipoles. Dipoles are areas where I don't share my electrons equally, so they spend a little more time or a little less time in certain places. Nonpolar things don't have dipoles, and because they don't have dipoles, they don't play nice with things that do. So hydrophobic tells us how these kinds of molecules feel about water. Water is a molecule that does have dipoles, and because water has dipoles, lipids don't play nice with it. So the fact that lipids are nonpolar and hydrophobic means that they have no dipoles, they share their electrons equally, and they're not going to be found next to water. The term lipids is what I would use to describe a macromolecule or a polymer. Let's now talk about the monomers that make up lipids. The monomers of lipids are fatty acids and fatty acids come in two main varieties. These are saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. When I talk about saturated fatty acids, we're talking about a string of carbons that are all saturated with hydrogen, meaning all of them are attached to as many hydrogens as possible. We see no double bonds in between our carbons. Because we have no double bonds, these chains are straight and they're able to stack right on top of each other. This is going to allow saturated fatty acids to be solid at room temperature. So whether we're talking about fat like butter made with saturated fatty acids or fat like we'd find on meat at the supermarket or even inside of you, Saturated fatty acid chains are used to build the kind of fat that would be solid at room temperature. Compare that to unsaturated fatty acids. When I use unsaturated fatty acids, I'm talking about chains that do have some double bonds. Because of those double bonds, we end up with places where my carbon chain bends or it has a kink. These kinks are going to prevent me from squeezing together my fatty acids nearly as closely. So because I cannot pack those things together in a straight line like I could with the saturated fatty acids, we end up with things that are liquid at room temperature. So when you're thinking about where we'd find unsaturated fatty acids, this is going to be all of your plant-based oils. So olive oil, vegetable oil, sunflower oil, Anything that exists as a liquid at room temperature is going to be considered to have been made with unsaturated fatty acids. Now I do need to qualify that statement because technically there are two kinds of unsaturated fatty acids. We have what are called cis unsaturated fatty acids and trans unsaturated fatty acids. Now when I talk about unsaturated fats, I'm typically referring to these over here. 
the cis unsaturated fatty acids. These are what occur normally in nature. So a cis unsaturated fatty acid means that my two hydrogens on, on the sides of the double bond are on the same side. When the two hydrogens are on the same side, we get that kink in the fatty acid chain, which means that we are liquid at room temperature. But I do, can also make it so that those hydrogens are on opposite sides of the double bond. And you can see that down here in my picture. Here's a double bond represented with two lines. The hydrogens are on opposite sides of that double bond. There is no kink in my fatty acid chain because those hydrogens are on opposite sides. And the only way we see this happen is when we make these. So you would hear these referred to as trans fats. And perhaps you've heard that trans fats are not good for your body. That is correct. They are man-made fats where we still have that double bond, but now we've taken what was unique to having a double bond, meaning us having this kink in our fatty acid chain. Now we've gotten rid of that kink, which allows these trans fats to also be solid at room temperature. So in general, we like unsaturated fatty acids better than saturated ones. The exception to that are trans fats. Trans fats act just like saturated fats do and give us just the same kinds of problems. One other note about our types of fatty acids, we also have some that are called essential fatty acids. And when we talk about essential fatty acids, just like their name would suggest, these are things that are essential to your survival. That being said, your body doesn't have the ability to make them on your own. So these are fatty acids that you have to obtain through your diet. The two main types of essential fatty acids are omega-3 fatty acids, which we find primarily in fish, like salmon, trout, or tuna, as well as omega-6 fatty acids. And we find omega-6 fatty acids in things like nuts or vegetable oils or even in fried food. Omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are both essential. We need them in our body, but we need them at the accurate ratio. If we don't have them at the accurate ratio, it can actually offset these benefits that we see here, which if we have the correct ratio are things like reducing heart attack risk or lowering blood pressure. In general, in the American diet, we have too much omega-6 fatty acids and not enough omega-3 fatty acids. If you go to the grocery store, you'll see supplements like this, omega-3 fatty acids specifically providing us from fish oil the type of essential fatty acid that's critical to helping us reduce our heart, heart risks. Now that we've talked about our different types of fatty acids, our monomers, let's talk about the polymers that we use those pieces to build. The first thing I build with fatty acids are called triglycerides, or occasionally you'll see them called triacylglycerol. Really the big thing I want you to take away with their names is this tri part. Tri means three, and triglycerides are molecules that are made with three fatty acid tails and one glycerol. Triglycerides, three and one. Underline highlight star that the name of the kind of bonds I use to build triglycerides are ester bonds. When we built the polymer of carbohydrates, when we, we built our, our big carbohydrates, we used what was called glycosidic bonds. When I'm building a triglyceride, or when I'm building these lipids in general, I'm gonna use ester bonds to do that. What's special about ester bonds is that when I build them, I release a molecule of water. So each ester bond that I build to attach a fatty acid to glycerol releases a molecule of water. This means that by the end of building a triglyceride, I've created three water molecules and three ester bonds. 
Triglycerides are the first example of a lipid that we're talking about because these are the type of lipid that are heavily involved in energy storage. You'll have to pardon my background noise. I am recording in a kitchen. <laughs> so triglycerides are used to store energy. They circulate in your bloodstream. This can be a really important marker of cholesterol in, in the blood. The next kind of lipid we're going to talk about are called phospholipids. And phospholipids are very similar to triglycerides. They still have a glycerol backbone. They still have fatty acids, though they only have two fatty acids. What's different is, is phospholipids have a phosphate group. That's how they got their name. Now that phosphate group is really important as we're considering the function of a phospholipid. That phosphate group, which is polar, is attracted to water. It likes water, whereas those lipid tails do not like water. So we have a word to describe what a phospholipid is. We call it amphipathic, amphipathic. And I want you to underline, highlight, star that word because that's an important word for us. When something is amphipathic, part of it is hydrophobic and part of it is hydrophilic. Remember that hydrophobic means I don't want to be by water. Hydrophilic means I love to be by water. The other words that mean the exact same thing are nonpolar, I don't play nice with water, and polar, I do play nice with water. So by having this different chemistry in the two parts, uh, we have a molecule that we call amphipathic. And the reason that that is significant, why we care about the fact that phospholipids are amphipathic, is because this is how we get the phospholipid bilayer. We have heads and we have tails. The tails don't like water, so they squeeze away from water. The heads do like water, so they're touching water. So the fact that phospholipids are amphipathic is what determines the structure of the phospholipid bilayer. Our next kind of lipid are what we call steroids. And when we talk about steroids, this is the first kind of lipid that exhibits a ring structure. So you can see it in our picture over here, four carbon rings that are attached to each other. We also see a little tail that sticks off from these hormones, the, these rings, excuse me. That tail is typically where we find the functional groups for these steroids. Remember that functional groups are what gives something its chemical properties. So whatever it is that I attach to these chains that are sticking off of the four carbon rings, that's going to determine what I'm able to do with that steroid. The most common steroid that we have in the body is cholesterol. And when we talk about cholesterol, the reason that it's so common is because this is my template or this is my starting point for all other steroid hormones. So notice that we have our four carbon rings that I can see here. Those same four carbon rings are present down here with some modifications as we can see in a few different places, but most especially on that tail that's sticking out. So we start with cholesterol and we modify it into other things like cortisol, which is our stress hormone, or other steroid hormones that we see in the body. One final kind of lipid that's worth mentioning are waxes. And when we talk about waxes, you can see in my picture up here that these are made out of very long fatty acid chains. We don't see rings, we don't see the functional groups, just these long chains of fatty acids. Because we have so many carbons and hydrogens and not a lot of other things, waxes are hydrophobic. Hopefully by now, we're totally a whiz at what hydrophobic means. But remember that hydrophobic means I'm afraid of water. So hydrophobic things, afraid of water, like waxes. Waxes don't want to be around water. We see waxes in a couple of different locations where their hydrophobic nature is helpful. For example, on the surface of leaves, making leaves very shiny. Next time you see a shiny leaf, you're seeing the wax on its outer surface. We also see some aquatic birds having, their, having some wax actually inside their feathers as their feathers grow. 
The reason that we find it in these two places is because the ultimate job of a wax is to prevent water from sticking to a surface. We don't want too much water on the outside of our leaves. We don't want too much water on the outside of our ducts. Because of this, we'll cover the outside with wax and that will repel the water. That's it for our discussion of lipids. Coming up next will be a discussion of proteins as well as nucleic acids.